Hello and welcome to We the People. I'm Gargi Rawat. In a very welcome step towards doing away with stereotypes and perceived notions against women, earlier this week the Supreme Court compiled a glossary of words and phrases to be avoided by judges and lawyers while writing judgments or filing cases before the courts. The 30-page handbook on combating gender stereotypes states that words like slut, whore, harlot, seductress, fallen woman, woman of easy virtue, Indian woman or Western woman should now be referred to as just woman. The word Eve teasing will now be termed as street sexual harassment and here I have to add that at NDTV we did away with the word Eve teasing or the phrase Eve teasing a long time ago. We called it sexual harassment. Dutiful wife, faithful wife, obedient wife has been replaced with simply wife. Hermaphrodite should be intersex and sex change is sex reassignment and there are many many more examples. We'll run those examples through the show. Now this maiden step by the top court is extremely important not just for the courts but also for all of us as a society at large for schools, for the media, for political leaders to be aware that words matter and it's high time we did away with biased language that perpetuate certain gender stereotypes. Uh, well, to talk more about this today on the show, we're joined by Meghna Kulkarni, member Swikar, the Rainbow Parents. It's a support group for parents of LGBTQ plus community members. Karuna Nandi, Advocate Supreme Court, Ashutosh Srivastava, Advocate Supreme Court, uh, Brinda Adige, women, uh, a women rights activist, Rohan Bhatt, queer rights activist and lawyer, uh, Kabir, a content creator. Thank you all for joining us on this very important topic so we can talk more about what the top court has you know, sought to do. And I'd like to start with you, Meghna Kulkarni, uh, your views on this and how this should also be you know, a lesson to society at large about language and gender stereotypes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, the first thought that came to my mind when I went through this entire handbook was wow. And uh, the wow was for many reasons. One, because the, the apex court, the, the, the top court has come out with a, such a such an amazing uh, glossary, which will definitely, you know, come down to each and every person who's on the street. I mean, it's not just the people who can understand the language, but this language will be, you know, it will come down to each and every one of us. And all of okay. us will surely and gradually learn how to use the right, the neutral language. It has to be a general neutral language. Uh, so it, it will trickle down to each and everybody. And definitely we will come to a point where the society um, looks at each and every individual for the worth that they are, that they are. And that made me really very happy. Right, uh, Brinda Adige, uh, your comments here and while of course this is not going to do away with certain notions that people have, preconceived notions and you know certain narratives that go against women, uh, it's, it's still an important step and the need of the hour to create more awareness about issues like this and how sometimes we're just geared or we've been programmed to think of things in a particular way or use a particular language that goes against women. You're absolutely right. Gendered language, gendered statements are conditioned. But the Supreme Court taking a stance officially endorsing that these words and phrases are not to be used in official language, whether in speech or in writing, is something that we must applaud. Because it has been too long that we have allowed this kind of a language, these words to be used in judgments and verdicts and arguments in the courts, when the courts are supposed to be upholding constitutional guarantees of not just equality, but also dignity. And these words, the glossary that has been put forth, I think is very good. Now it is time for the courts to also say, everybody, irrespective of their seniority, get into training, unlearn a lot of stuff, and relearn all of this that is most important to uphold, again, our constitutional values and principles. Right, and there's also a need for society to be aware of this and also unlearn a lot of, uh, you know, notions that they have, isn't it? Absolutely. So we begin with the courts because these phrases have continued and the courts have always been held as the final word in most things. 
So it is time that they begin. They have started with a glossary, and I hope they also continue with this practice. And their vocabulary brings in all of these changes. Yes, our educational institutions, our training institutions, and our communities and societies and families need to unlearn, need to get out of that conditioning of this gendered, feminine abuses that they actually give, which are feminine language abuses, must be done away with. But I'm happy that the court has come forward with this glossary. Like I said, time for them to also unlearn, relearn, and consciously practice this language of respect and dignity towards women and other people. Right, uh, Ashutosh Srivastav, uh, you know, some of the words that are in this handbook, one can't imagine that they're actually used in court or come up. Uh, your uh, view on this and tell us about, you know, any experiences you've had in the courts. Uh, see, many a times it happens uh, that the language, that, that is actually the most important factor in the entire judicial system, including the arguments or the uh, judgments or decrees being passed from time to time. And I think there has to be some sensitivity when we argue or whatever it happens in the judicial system because uh, that every time the court is filled up with uh, commoners also, people are there around, sometimes even in family matters, the children are also around. So I think there has to be a decency which has to be maintained in the court uh, by the lawyers and also uh, while passing the judgments. There are many such instances uh, uh, which have taken place and I have witnessed that uh, the language which, which were used uh, could have been somewhat decent. Uh, because see, a court is a place where we go and we try to get justice uh, for people. And while attaining so, uh, obviously it should, it should sound also in the similar manner because the words which are being used, uh, that works as a vehicle uh, for concluding any sort of... Uh, uh, justice to the people who seek for and they, they approach the courts. So I feel that it is a very uh, correct move and the Chief Justice has uh, uh, really taken uh, this into consideration uh, and also with the help of many other judges and uh, judicial officers and activists who have come across and uh, it was I think uh, pending also uh, since the pandi uh, pandemic time and now it has been uh, brought on surface uh, by introducing this uh, handbook. And I'm sure this will really serve a better purpose to the society as a whole. And uh, the stereotype, the language, the words uh, will take its, uh, you know, the back uh, uh, way. And uh, the new way of judgmental process will start, which will uh, give confidence to the people who go to the court that they can go with decency, with dignity, and they can, uh, you know, be assured that uh, during the entire process, their uh, respect and everything will be maintained uh, while uh, uh, arguing right. during the arguments or by, while submitting the do documents or even in the judgments. Many a times people are afraid to even to look at the judgment, what would have been passed, because, because there are many allegations being made by uh, each, you know, by the parties against each other, those allegations are also written in the uh, in the orders, in the judgments. So all these things, I think, will uh, improve, and it will be a better idea. And it's it's a very it it, it should be applauded by, by all of us, actually. That's right, uh, Rohan Bhatt. Uh, your experience also. This is a start with with this handbook being introduced. How has it been received? Uh, you know, if you could share with uh, share with us. Uh, and 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 again, I'm asking. Uh, many of these sort of stereotypes actually used in court by the judges and those arguing cases as well. Yes, I think it's a definitely a progressive step in the right direction. I think since Chief Justice Chandrachud took over, the court has been making progress on inclusivity, be it in matters of caste, gender, sexuality, or disability. But I think while this book is a welcome step, I think it leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, this book, for example, is only published in English. A majority of people who interact with the justice system do so at a trial court level, where English is often not the language in which the proceedings are conducted. My second problem with this book is that it could be more intersectional. I think often when courts, for example, deal with rape cases, they sort of forget that caste hierarchies play a role or the sexuality of the victim plays a role. For example, a lot, a lot of people I have interacted with have been subjected to corrective rape 
because of their sexuality. I think this book could in future perhaps interact more uh, thoroughly with intersectionalities in which people exist. The final comment I have is that words like mm -hmm. slut, bastard, uh, faggot, for example, where the court gives us alternatives should perhaps be replaced with nil and to make sure that the court who makes a point that these words should not be period. The idea should not be to find politically correct alternatives, but to say that these words have no place in um, in our legal system. Another thing that I have, a, I think, should be acknowledged is that the word like words like prostitute, which find our way in our statutes, for example, there the judges have little choice but to use those words because the statute uses that word. How does the court suggest that judges interact with that? Be that as it may, and be keeping all these quibbles aside, I think this is a definitely a welcome step in the right direction. Perhaps with public comments, public, perhaps with future reiterations, there is, there will be perhaps more inclusive language that is included. Right, very important points that you're making there. Yes, this is a start, but clearly uh, there is, you know, more to be done, uh, uh, you know, more left, to, uh, you know, is, that is desirable, that steps need to be taken. But again, a first step, uh, Kabir, as somebody, you know, who's on uh, social media, content creator, this is also something that uh, is a lesson for media, for are you hopeful that, you know, whether it be, be it films or uh, content, that there as well we'll find a certain amount of sensitivity and awareness coming in. Totally, I agree with, in fact, all the panelists that I've just spoken about, I completely agree with all of uh, the points that I've made. And uh, just to add to those is that it, because courts really set the precedent, not just for the judiciary or uh, the courts or the, the, the coming cases, but also for society. So in a way, uh, the courts are, the judiciary here is actually leading the society. And once they started, uh, I think this also is a testament to the fact that it's our judiciary is also like a, a lie, alive, it's breathing, it's it's evolving. Uh, so yeah, kudos to that to realize that there are implicit biases there in the first place. And once they are called out, that's the first step. And then moving further from there, uh, that the, the corrective actions are uh, to be taken. But I, th I still feel that even the current document that we have, actually the handbook that has been rolled out, uh, does cover some sort of intersectionality. Uh, there's room for more, of course there is. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a welcome start nonetheless. All right, uh, Karuna, uh, your you know comments on this. We've been talking about uh, the handbook and how welcome it is. Uh, uh, though Rohan Bhatt raising some important points, he had a few quibbles about certain words that was have still been left in certain sentiments that have been left in, which he feels uh, should be done away with. Also, the fact that it should also be available in in different languages. But uh, yes, your comments on this uh, very welcome first step by the Supreme Court. I think it's an excellent step. Um... See, the, uh, the trouble with only having some progressive judgments or, and a fair number of progressive judgments from the Supreme Court is that it wasn't filtering down as much as it should have, right? Like, uh, because the Supreme Court, whether it is saying something obiter, which means that even if it's not deciding a particular issue, but it's, if it's just um, something is being said, then it still binds the high court and the high court, you know, their, their judgments on this to say that even Obiter binds the um, high court and uh, Obiter and the high court judgment binds the district courts. And when words like ravished are used for rape, right, and for something as serious as sexual assault, then it kind of, it made it something different. Um, when ideas of honor came into um, how sentencing was to be done. And there are, there's a study that was done by Mrinal Satish, Professor Mrinal Satish, when he was at Yale, that looked at all of the high court judgments and all of the Supreme Court judgments on rape. And he found that um, if you were single and had never been married and you were raped, then the sentence was the highest, particularly because there was a presumption of virginity. When the person was married and there was an accusation of rape uh, and there was a conviction for rape, then the um, sentence would be lower 
but if the person if the prosecutrix was single and there was some alleged prior sexual activity then the sentence would be the lowest so those sorts of ideas are things that we've been dealing with through the national judicial academy where and the delhi judicial academy where i've done workshops and both i've done a number of workshops and um you know we we must remember that judges are from the community that we are all from right and so and we all actually carry a uh, heterosexist bias we all carry casteist bias we all carry bias against those with less financial privilege with class privilege and all of that must be um addressed so it can't all be done in one go this is a good start um in terms of um addressing women from different backgrounds for example prejudice against um uh dalit women certain presumptions uh prejudice that concerns muslim women different kinds of prejudice that plays out in different ways um sometimes and we found this in a number of cases it's it's allowing others to speak for them when it comes to rights as opposed to requiring the kind of representation in court that would be required if um the case was concerning upper caste hindu men right um right i think those all, all those issues are there but this is a great start and uh hopefully we will come to the other issues. right and we were also talking about how this you know is something that needs to start a conversation in society at large there needs to be awareness in schools uh you know in the media as well about the kind of words we use the kind of uh, phrases yeah. we may use uh brinda dige uh, your uh, comments on uh, the points that rohan bhat had raised earlier when he said that you know he, he, while it's a welcome start he has a few quibbles he also feels that this should be in other languages as well he's absolutely right because we know that the english language is very much where masculine but if you look at our regional languages and the words that they would use to abuse or insult are all feminine in gender and that is where our biggest problem is so the court has done a good start with english because m- much of the judgments are there in english only the verdicts are also there in english almost all our laws are there only in english but like he said the arguments that are put forth by courts well, not only the high court but below that also is in the regional language and that is why translating all of this is not only going to be a challenge but it is important because that is the language that we all use and like karuna said all judges come from our own communities so which means that our community societies institutions and families will also have to start working on shattering breaking these stereotypes especially with the language because this gendered language of abuse is the first thing that you know everybody the first thing anybody scolds someone wants to hurt insult is a word or a phrase where the woman of that family or the house or the other woman is to be insulted so the regional language translations right. is important but training is more is important so much more important because it's not going to go come overnight it's a practice that is what i said one has to unlearn there's so much that that person has to work on himself or herself sitting in that position to be able to say okay i am not going to use this language i shall not use this language and that is why the training is required and we need to begin with our schools also right absolutely and the person who spoke about the media we we must understand that they also promote a lot of this gendered notions i was the person who spoke about the media and, and said that and what the ban must do no all absolutely of the, here at ndtv in away. fact uh, you know when you have uh, cases of what we refer to as honor killing we a long time ago decided to call it dishonor killing eve teasing we've done away with here we call it sexual harassment the supreme court in the handbook has called it street sexual harassment which is very welcome ashutosh shivasa so once again uh, the supreme court you know really leading the way on this issue uh, and uh, politicians not so much Yes uh, absolutely uh, i think uh, see there is improvement always in every field in you know in every direction and whenever supreme court takes uh, anything into consideration uh, now we have seen that it goes uh, to conclude it to find a concrete uh, answer to it 
and to finally adjudicate it and take a final decision. So I think uh, we should welcome from one to the other. I'm sure there would be many other changes in different fields as well, which would be considered uh, by the Supreme Court. We have many uh, such kind of uh, issues pending and the hearings are being conducted from time to time. And, uh, you know, that this improvement everywhere in the entire country, in the judicial system, language, boards, these are very, very important uh, to be revised, to be uh, made decent, uh, which uh, the Supreme Court has taken into consideration. And I'm sure uh, things will improve further. So far right. as the regional language and other languages are concerned, as somebody rightly said that uh, all the judgments, though, are not in English. But yes, there is a start, obviously. And uh, even if there is no such handbook for the regional languages, that doesn't mean that every anyone is allowed to speak in any indecent manner or to, uh, you know, to continue with the judicial system, which is not uh, in consistence uh, with our constitution. So everyone is equally responsible, even when there is no handbook, it doesn't mean uh, that you don't have to follow uh, a, right. a, a this, decent this, way of uh, The sentiment working. should, should uh, you know, yes. travel so a, that, around uh, all the courts and various levels. Uh, Karuna, and what we were also talking about is uh, how this needs to be, you know, a starting point for society at large, uh, the media as well, politicians, even in schools to have more awareness around this, that words matter. I think that's so true. But also just to clarify, sure. um, the constitutional courts all operate in English. So every high court in the country operates yes. in English. The Supreme Court operates in English, right? A lot of the district courts operate in English. For example, um, uh, I argued a anticipatory bail matter in Ambala a few years ago. Um, and this is not common, it's true, but that was all in English. The judgment was an excellent judgment. Um, and I honestly think that that judge is sort of worthy of the Supreme Court, but um, that was in English. So it's not so language. Yes, it's an it's a step that can be taken and should be taken, but it's not as big a thing as, um, you know, we might think it is with regard to how we deal with each other and constitutionalism and constitutional values to be inculcated in ourselves and in schools and in the media and everywhere else, right? The idea of substantive equality, the idea of respect for wherever the other person is coming from, not, that they don't have to be like us, you know, to have to extend ourselves to understand where the other person is located. I think that is something today that is a really burning issue in our country. And right. with the division that have come in the way to build up our polity again our idea of ourselves as indians is what you are saying to have it not just in schools but to internalize it in the media to internalize it in all of our you know whether it's my chamber or whether it's how we speak in court or whether it's how we deal with people that we interact with on a regular basis I think that's something we have to, in lots of different ways, bring and build our country back up. Right. Uh, Rohan Bhatt, so your, uh, your response to that, and we're uh, you know, coming to the, towards the end of the show, so final comments on this. Well, I think I'm being misunderstood. This is, I think, a brilliant step that the court has taken, and well begun is half done. But it's only half done. Half still remains to be done, is what I'd say. And my second uh, one more thing that I would want to point out is that language is fluid. It keeps on evolving. Right. What might be politically correct today might not be politically correct 10 years down the line. So this book is a good step. And I don't want to kind of, you know, downplay the no, importance of... No, no, absolutely of not. But it was important to raise certain but points that you did. At the same did, time, yes. I think as much as we laud the court for this, it's important that all of us critically engage with this book. And to acknowledge that, for example, let's look at the word sex change, right? The court says the word sex reassignment or gender transition. Yes. Um, a lot of queer scholars, and there's a broad consensus within the community that it, it's now called gender affirming care. That's perhaps yes. one of the things yes. that the court yes. gets incorrect. And 
I think that's for us to kind of, you know, engage critically and positively with the court to kind of tell the court that, look, it's well done, but there are still a lot of things that remain to be done. Be that as it may, I think it's a welcome step and we should all appreciate it. All right. Well, on that note, I'm out of time. I'll have to end this show. But thank you all for joining us. And uh, the point is to create more awareness about this as well. A very welcome first step by the Supreme Court and one that we hope uh, will affect society at large and make us all think about the kind of phrases and the words we use. Thank you all for watching. Goodbye.